Leicestershire Police. Apart from its role operating the air attack warning system, the peacetime responsibilities of the police would have continued in war. However, it is fair to say they would have acquired additional powers and responsibilities. In a build-up to war, the Chief Constable for Leicestershire would have located himself at the sub-regional headquarters bunker, Burda Street, Loughborough. In the immediate aftermath of a nuclear exchange he would have become sub-regional police commissioner and been in charge of the surviving Leicestershire and Northamptonshire forces until such time as the regional control bunker, Chalfant Drive, Nottingham or Skendilby. Lincolnshire became operational. Once this location had been activated the Chief Constable of Nottinghamshire Police who would already have been located there would become Regional Police Commissioner and take charge of the entire Midlands Police Forces. The Assistant Chief Constable would have positioned himself at the County Hall Control Bunker. Other senior police officers would locate themselves at District Council Control Bunkers and all of these would have become Police Liaison Officers. In each county parish a person would have been nominated to liaise with the police and to assist with local knowledge. In addition to established procedures for meeting extraordinary manpower demands, in war a number of small police support units PSUs, each of 24 personnel under an inspector, would be formed on a divisional basis under the control of the chief constable. These units would only be formed on receipt of a direction notice from the Home Office. Each PSU would have its own transport and equipment. The PSUs were designed to give greater flexibility in the control and deployment of police manpower before and after an attack. The provisioning of the PSUs would have necessitated additional stocks of food, water, sanitary necessities, fuel, batteries or other lighting equipment to be held at divisional HQs. Chief constables would have the power to prevent police officers from leaving the service. This would apply to both those who are apply for retirement and those reaching compulsory retirement age. The special constabulary would be called upon for extended periods of service. Members of the public who offered the services would, if suitable, be invited to join the special constabulary. Additional manpower would also be added to ancillary services i.e. clerical, typing staffs, telephone and radio operators, drivers, messengers and dispatch riders. It is also possible that use might have been made of traffic wardens. In the build-up to war, the police would have secured the designated essential service routes these are outlined in the transport chapter and kept him clear for essential supplies, services and the armed forces. Known subversives and most probably over-vocal anti-war protesters would have been placed under arrest. Ominously, local civil defense plans make the following reference the police to maintain law and order as democratically as possible but with certain modifications to the British penal system. Barry Hines in his superb film, Threads, depicts widespread looting and thus makes shift caging. One scene from the film shows a tennis court being used, and shooting of offenders. True this is only a film depiction but it would not be difficult to envisage that looting would be a major post-attack problem with lack of food availability. Guidance to police forces in the event of war came in the form of the Police Manual of Home Defense, from the Home Office. This document was to be given to each and every police officer. It was classed top secret and was not available to the public. The manual talks of the special powers police forces would have acquired. Under a special police act, the police would have the power to requisition private motor vehicles and equipment for duty. It also talks of the necessity for the police to guard essential resources such as fuel points, petrol stations and food stocks, large supermarkets. As to guarding with what? The manual states members of the police force assigned to certain special duties may have to carry firearms. Firearms will be carried only by men trained in their use. Of course all of this relied heavily upon the survival of police manpower and resources. 
Under the heading, Protection of Police Buildings, the manual states, steps would be taken to increase, where necessary, the protective factor of police premises against fallout. As far as practicable, personnel at police stations will be accommodated in buildings affording good fallout protection and additional protection will be given to important rooms such as communications centers. Windows would be treated against flash and combustible materials removed from vulnerable places, water would be conserved for firefighting, firefighting equipment would be augmented and distributed, additional protection would be given to petrol and other fuel supplies. One can only assume from this that extensive window whitewashing, sandbagging and earth mounding would have been used as no police station in Leicestershire has any basement of any description bar Hinkley Police Station which has a simple modest basement. It seems quite surprising that neither Inderby County Police HQ nor Charles Street City HQ had any below ground structures but this is fact. On receipt of the air attack warning via carrier control, WB-1400 or by siren, police officers would be advised to take appropriate action dependent on their location. If on foot patrol, take immediate cover and direct the public to do the same. In vehicles, pull into the side of the road and take cover. At a police station, take cover in basement or other protected places. Remember only Hinkley Police Station has a basement. Off duty, take cover wherever the officer may be. Strangely the manual states that communication centers will continue to be manned, but personnel on duty will be reduced to a minimum. This suggests that officers would remain at the desks when the air raid sirens were going off outside. This seems an optimistic plan. Post-strike and once radiation conditions allowed, police officers were to make their way to their nearest police station. Much sooner than this however, would be the necessity to check surviving resources, frantic communications checks would have been made between Enderby HQ and the divisional HQs. In turn, contact would attempt to be made with the subordinate police stations. Then a try would have to be made to contact the local authority and seat of government control bunkers. Once estimation could be made of what resources remained, this information would have to be transmitted to the sub-regional police commissioner. Probably one of the biggest initial problems the police would face, apart from the direct effects of the explosions, would be the maintaining of morale. Officers would be forced by fallout to stay undercover for long periods conditions within shelters would have a direct bearing on morale. Food and water rationing would have to be regularly assessed, water scarcity would mean less washing, provision made for dealing with human body waste and activities to pass the time considered the guidance manual suggests card games. Interestingly, to deal with the need for officers to go to the toilet it is suggested that if police station toilets could not be reached a trench be dug inside the refuge. On receipt of the all clear to leave the shelter, as many offices as possible would have been issued with radiac reading instruments, the police would have to face enormous challenges to get law and order under control. Apart from the problem of looting which I have already mentioned, the police force's primary aim would be to restrict the movement of the surviving population. All home defense planning is aimed at people staying as close to home as possible to stop large population movements and thus placing too heavy a burden on some authorities. The police, under direction from the local accommodation offices within council control bunkers, would get the public billeted as quickly as possible. Also, the police would direct people to and control the emergency feeding arrangements. Police stocks and fuel supplies would need to be carefully guarded. The police would also be a source of radiation and fallout information. Stretches of the essential service routes which survived would need clearing and controlling assistance for this would come from the county direct labor organization. To allow aerial reconnaissance the RAF would have allotted a small number of light aircraft to each region. Police trained in air observation would be able to map out conditions and make public announcements from these aircraft. Special attention would be paid to population movements and warnings given for people to return to their homes.
prison service. In a nuclear war, the prison service would have been in the most difficult position of all. Do you leave prisoners locked up unable to defend themselves? Colin Henson is operations manager for the prison service in a build-up to war there were no plans to release any low-level offenders. There were no bunkers for prison staff. The prison service was expected to continue as normal in peacetime. I could not discuss any longer-term post-war arrangements. Would there have been any? I am sure readers will make up their own minds about that. Leicestershire Fire and Rescue Service The Leicestershire Fire and Rescue Service are extremely sensitive about their war plans but the following is what is known. In a build-up in international tension, the chief fire officer would locate himself at the county hall control bunker. It was anticipated that each fire service would be self-sufficient and thus control would remain with the chief fire officer. However, once the regional government control, Chalfant Drive, Nottingham or Skendelby, Lincolnshire, was activated, the head of the Nottinghamshire service would have become regional fire commander and be able if necessarily to redistribute resources amongst the Midlands services. Nominated fire liaison officers would also be appointed to position themselves at district council control bunkers. A key point here is that only Fire HQ stand but Leicester Central Lancaster Place of the 21 county fire stations figure given as is at 1986. Was there any kind of basement although this was prone to flooding and thus not usable? The Glenfield Force HQ does have a basement but it was neither adequate nor kitted out as an operational base post stripe, extensive sandbagging perhaps. However, each of these locations did have a WB-1400 attack warning receiver installed so it is clear that they still intended and to be staffed. Indeed, certain fire station posts held strategic fuel stocks which would have been topped up and sealed. The Home Office state that emergency plans provided for the deployment of the service in a large number of small units, called companies. Where a company was equipped with peacetime appliances it would be known as a red company, and where a company has been equipped with emergency appliances withdrawn from home office stores it would be known as a green company. Companies would have remained under the control of the chief fire officer subject to any overriding policy directions given by the county controller. Another planned measure in the build-up to war was to move fire engines to positions of safety. The locations chosen are not in the public domain although clearly these would be as far from concentrations of buildings as possible. In the immediate aftermath of nuclear war, fire fighting would have been quite impracticable. Fallout and burst water mains would restrict both officer movement and water supplies and thus fires on the whole would have been left to burn themselves out tasks once the release from shelter all clear was given would be to fight fires where worthwhile, provide assistance in the provision of drinking water and removal of radioactive material from key installations. Leicestershire Ambulance Service during the 1980s the county had its own independent Leicestershire Ambulance and Paramedic Service LAPS which has now been absorbed into an East Midlands combined authority. As the LAPS grew increasingly divorced from a local government it in fact fell outside the scope of the Leicestershire Civil Defence Plans. Indeed there was little in the way of planning by the LAPS itself relating to the Cold War. There was however some transition to war procedures and some plans in the event of nuclear attack to enable the maintenance of radio communications. Alan Parker was the chief ambulance officer and latterly the chief executive of the LAPS from September 1983 until March 1999. He explained to me the transition to war role, under NHS plans to clear non-urgent cases from hospitals, the LAPS would have assisted with helping patients to return home. 
During the transition to war period the ambulance service would have maintained the normal emergency service. This would have meant that the service would have made a normal response to 999 and doctors' urgent calls for a patient's admission to hospital or transfer from one hospital to another. But what of the service under imminent strike in post-nuclear strike conditions? As there was nothing documented or required of the LAPS personnel it in the end would have come down to their own sense of duty. As Mr. Parker outlines, to disperse the vehicles as widely as possible we would have canvassed for volunteers to take ambulance vehicles home with them and hoped they were still there when it was all over. In reality yes, agreed Mr. Parker. In a post-strike scenario the LAPS had a stock of second-hand radios to enable communication between units. Mr. Parker outlines plans for a post-attack communications network. These radios were held in strategic locations where aerials had been previously located. The radios were not connected to the aerial or power to protect them from electromagnetic pulse emitted from nuclear explosions. The equipment was capable of running off 12 volts and could have used car batteries for power in the short term. This series of radio sites would have formed the backbone of ambulance communications after a strike. Did the LAPS have a protected or underground HQ prepared? The nominated wartime HQ was the peacetime officers at Grange Lane in Leicester, but Mr. Parker states, the yard at the rear of Grange Lane housed a large generator probably strong enough to power half of Leicester. But there was no underground bunker prepared. Could he have authorized one built? Mr. Parker dismisses this idea with increasing pressures on the lab service allocating financial resources to one would have been neither desirable nor acceptable to the public. But what of his own personal role? In the event of a transition to war it is probable that the ambulance service management and control would have located together with the local authority, police and fire services in one location. This could possibly have been the local authority bunker, most likely county hall. In these circumstances I would have been expected to locate myself at this facility. National Health Service NHS Managers of the NHS would face insurmountable problems trying to deliver a post-attack service. Indeed a group of doctors calling themselves the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War in the 1980s put it quite starkly, medical services would be overwhelmed if nuclear war occurred. Locally in Leicestershire target predictions meant that the main county hospital, Leicester Royal Infirmary, would be completely destroyed and that Leicester General, Glenfield General and Loughborough General hospitals would at best survive badly damaged. Many doctors and nurses themselves would have been killed. Effects of nuclear exchange would be multiple injuries, radiation sickness, psychological shock and extreme burns. The latter of these would be of grave concern as Leicester Royal Infirmary had the only specialist burns unit in the county and itself could only deal with three cases at any one time even in peacetime. It is quite obvious therefore that normal peacetime standards of care would not be available post-strike. In a build-up to war emergency, powers would permit the NHS to accelerate the discharge of patients from hospitals, with the aid of the ambulance service, reduce intake to emergency cases only, requisition private medical resources and disperse hospital supplies and staff. In essence the latter of these was the key to NHS nuclear war strategy. Medical resources were vulnerable as they were concentrated in target areas, thus communities, parish and ward councils would stockpile their own medical resources and set up first aid posts. The NHS regional planning team wrote to each parish council requesting locations of nominated first aid posts, often schools, and their arrangements would be made for resources to be provided from central store. As is to be discussed, it was anticipated that the Sunt John's Ambulance and British Red Cross voluntary teams would staff these posts. 
Post-strike, the NHS prioritization of patients would be turned completely on its head. Those suffering from radiation sickness alone would be turned away as there is no specific treatment available aside from extensive blood transfusion which would be impossible due to lack of blood and be far too labor-intensive. A new three-tier prioritization system would be in effect. Level 1 would be those classed as unlikely to survive after treatment, level 2 those likely to survive without any treatment and finally level 3 those likely to survive due to treatment. Only level 3 patients would receive any medical attention and even this would exclude labor-intensive attention such as with fractures. To meet the planning for nuclear war challenge, in March 1981, the DHSS authorized and funded the creation of a planning post in each regional health authority. Leicestershire occupied Trent Region. The appointment in Trent Region was awarded to a Jack Costley and his efforts resulted in a consultation document entitled, Civil Defense in the Health Service, in 1983. This document proposed the relevant officers to be nominated health liaison in county council and district council bunkers and detailed dispersal of medical resources.